Luke chapter 4. As I preach to you today, I want you just to begin to think of things that the enemy is trying to do to you, and I want you to believe that God is going to break that thing by the power of the Holy Ghost. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, this is Jesus speaking. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Notice he did not say God is sending me the brokenhearted. He said he is sending me to the brokenhearted and he is sending me to preach deliverance, which means freedom to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. The reason he closed the book, because there was nothing more to be said. Now, I thank you, Lord Jesus, God, that your word right now is a fire that's being loosed in the earth. And God, out of this sanctuary today, we're loosing a holy unction of God. Lord, we declare war on the enemy. God, every demon spirit we bind in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, release, hallelujah, your authority and your anointing upon your servant. Thy word is already anointed, but God, anoint me to release the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. This is Jesus declaring after baptism that the Father has anointed him and he names a few things. But the one that I want to focus on here is Jesus said this, I have been anointed by the Holy Ghost to preach deliverance or freedom to the captive. The word deliverance means to release from bondage to release from imprisonment, liberty, forgiveness, and remission from sin. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says this, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So the Lord begins to declare. He begins to define his ministry. It would behoove ministry today and churches across the world to go back and to redefine their personal visions. He did not call us just to build wonderful buildings. He did not call us to be entertainment centers. He did not call us to be somehow a dead care center for your children. Listen, I'm not interested in just having your children come because they like what we have to offer them good games or good entertainment what we want to offer them is the baptism of the Holy Ghost at a young age that when they are older hallelujah they're not pregnant at 14 and they're not cutting themselves in their bedroom when they're 12 and they are not on drugs when they are 16 years old and they've not lost their mind with meth when they're 20 they're not divorced when they're 21 and they're not fired from their job when they're 25 because they've never learned how to rule their spirit. God said the church is raised up for one thing, to bring deliverance unto the captives. So if you are bound today, you are in the right house. Hallelujah. For God said this, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So no wonder there is a agenda that is in the earth not just in the United States. Much of the gospel that you and I enjoy today's roots are in Europe. Some of the greatest preachers in history came out of England, whether it's Charles Spurgeon or George Whitfield or John Wesley or Charles Wesley. The list goes on, and they came, and they brought the gospel. But what I'm saying is that the continent of Europe at one time was saturated with the glory of the Lord. There have been seasons where God's glory was in Africa or it was in other countries. 
And so there is this agenda, and now it has crept over into our own nation. I love what Mario said about, the, about the, uh, America. He said, God raised up America for three things. One, to feed the world. Number two, to bring the gospel to the world. And number three, to protect Israel. That is the agenda of this country. That's why we have been birthed. Two of those have rapidly begun to disappear. One is that the gospel is not being released from our nation anymore. In fact, America is in such dire straits spiritually that other countries are now singing, sending missionaries to the United States to try to evangelize us. The other is that the present day ungodly, illegal, president that's in our nation hates the nation of Israel. So God is doing something by the power of the Holy Ghost. But what I'm saying is this, that God raised the church up. And there is this influence, there's this attack right now to remove the Spirit of the Lord from our nation. Because if there is no presence of God, it doesn't matter how much your building costs, it doesn't matter what kind of degrees your preacher has, it doesn't matter how much money you have or who sings on your platform if there is no presence of the Lord there is no anointing and demons don't bow down to songwriting they don't bow down to authors they don't bow down to millionaires they bow down to Christians who are blood bought who are full of the Holy Ghost who are not moved and intimidated by the enemy I got news for hell today we are not going away this is not a fad we will not back down. We will not take a back seat. We will not throw in the towel. We're just getting warmed up by the power of the Holy Ghost. And God is telling us, rise and be accounted for. Boy, I feel the, all of the unction of the Lord today. Hallelujah. Don't make the devil mad. They say, let's make him mad. God is coming back to this church, to the earth, for one thing. He is coming to set people free. That's why the Lord said, I have been anointed to preach deliverance unto the captives. I'm believing that Kevin will stand on our platform in the weeks to come with a full head of hair and give a testimony how the Spirit of God set him free and healed him by the power of the Lord. I refuse to give Kevin to hell. I refuse to give his help to the enemy. And so today we stand on the word of the Lord and we declare cancer free. Not only cancer free, that every intent the enemy had against him and his family is reversed. And may the enemy have to give back to that family seven times what they took in the name of the Lord. Is there anybody in this building today that can say a witness to the Holy Ghost that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God wants to get you riled up in the Holy Ghost. This idea, well, hell will leave us alone. We'll leave them alone. No, sir. Give me your best shot. Listen, we've been through divorce. We've been through sickness. We've been through betrayal. We've been through discouragement and depression. We've stood at caskets we should not have stood up. We've been broke, hallelujah, rejected, spit on, mocked, and set aside. But can I tell you today, we're still standing by the power of the Holy Ghost. And there is help on us. There is an anointing in God from Australia to Indonesia from Indonesia to the Philippines may God invade Japan may God invade the earth with the glory and the power of the Holy Ghost God loves prison breaks Listen, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. So the enemy takes Paul and Silas, removes them from their place of preaching, 
removes them from whom they're preaching to. The devil is really stupid sometimes. Because Jesus said this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives. So why would you take two preachers and stick them in a prison where there's captives? When the Lord wrote it down, You stick deliverance and preachers that are anointed in a prison, something's going to happen. I'm going to mess up your prison. So here, Paul, and see, sometimes you and I think that where we are is because, well, the enemy is just trying to attack me and he's just coming against me. No, sometimes God will place you places that has nothing to do with the enemy attacking you. It has about putting you in strategic place because God wants to do something there and he needs men and women that are anointed that when he says it's time, he can release his purpose. So God takes Paul and Silas. Of course, we know they're beaten, so they're in a a lot of physical pain. They're moved from their platform. They're stuck into prison and they're locked down inside their And the Bible says, when you read this in the book of Acts, I'm not sure, I think it might be Acts chapter 7, it says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas begin to sing praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And as they begin to sing and the prisoners begin to hear them, the Scripture says that all God needed to begin to rock the foundations of the house was a little bit of praise in an impossible place. And while they were praising God, there came an earthquake and began to rattle the prison. The Bible says that when the earthquake hit while they're praising, that all of the doors were opened of the prison. And everybody that's been a prisoner now their doors of their cells are open. About that time, here comes the jailer, and he realizes what's happened. He's going to commit suicide because he knows either I kill myself or they're going to kill me for letting the prisoners escape. And about the time he gets ready to commit suicide, Paul says, Sir, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Praise will turn a prison where nobody wanted to be into a place that nobody wants to leave. Because the doors are open and ain't nobody walking out. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord got loose in the building and when they begin to praise, God turned the prison, hallelujah, into a place that they did not want to leave. Can I tell you that there are some things that God is getting ready to do by the Holy Ghost and He's reversing it by the Spirit of the Lord. This is why it's so important to pray in the Holy Ghost because God will let you see past where you are. I'll give you just another example. In fact, I think we'll just just read this. This is in Acts. Acts chapter 12, this is Apostle Peter. says, um, when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison, or they guarded the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. God, I really believe this right now, across the earth is beginning to go some places that the enemy thinks that he has guarded. That God can't get in there. 
that you take somebody that belongs to the Lord and you put him in a place that you think God doesn't know where he's at and you've messed up. There is no prison that God cannot break into. Doesn't matter if the doctor puts you in a prison that says cancer's on the door, or he puts you in a prison that says suicide's on the door, or he puts you in a prison that says there is no hope, it cannot happen. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, uh, there is liberty. God doesn't need the devil's key to get in the devil's house, uh, because when he came out of hell, he said, I've got the keys to death, hell and the grave. What does it mean? It means that God has a master key. It doesn't matter what lock you have, what cell you have, how many demons you have guarding the door. If the Lord wants to get inside, he's coming inside. And it doesn't matter what's happened in our nation. Hear me. There is a reversal, say of the Lord, that's getting ready to take place in the nation. And men will stand. Networks will say, how did this happen and I thy God declare to thee I am on my way to invade the darkness of hell and I am going to open the prison door says the Lord <laughs> hallelujah to say well you don't know pastor what's how many spirits are against me and how tied up I am Peter was in the inner sanctum of the prison. And yet, nothing could keep the angel of the Lord out. And what's great is, the keeper of the prison didn't even know the angel was there. They're just standing out there, you know, guarding the gate. And they don't know that on the inside, the angel of God has shown up. And he smites Peter. I love the fact that in the midst of this impossible situation, Peter was asleep. That's faith. He wasn't worried. Part of it was because the Bible says, while Peter's in prison, now the church was making prayer without ceasing. I'll bet James would have never had his head cut off if the church would have done for James what they did for Peter. And the angel touches Peter. He says, you're getting out. Peter's thinking, but what about all of this? And the angel says, just get up. And as he's getting up, chains begin to break, begin to snap begin to rattle. They're falling off of his hands. They're falling off his feet. Now he's got 16 soldiers in there and they can't even wake up. There is an incandestine anointing of God that is taking place right now that the enemy is not aware of, says the Lord. And right now there are chains breaking in this nation by the power of the Holy Ghost. Mayala Baba Sunday. Hallelujah. The chains that are on you in this building today, the chains of you that are watching around the world, the chains of you that are online parts of this church, break in the name of the Lord. Get up, get up, get up in the Holy Ghost because you're getting ready to leave your imprisonment by the Spirit of the Lord. God knows how to invade prisons. Matthew 25 41 says this, that hell was prepared or it was created for the devil and his angels. That's who God built hell for. You have people say, I just feel like I'm hell. Well, that, you're not, you weren't, that wasn't built for you. So you shouldn't be there. It's prepared for the devil and his angels. And so anytime you take part of the body of Christ and you stick them in hell, God's coming after them. 
because you don't belong there. Hallelujah. Glorification, you do not belong in the prison of cancer. Hallelujah. Kevin does not belong in the prison of brain cancer. See, because the devil doesn't just want to affect you. It's a ripple effect. It affects that boy's, that man's three children. Or, and, and I think I saw a girl there. It affects the wife that becomes a widow. It affects the parents and the grandparents. It affects the friends that are around them. And not only that, it destroys the faith of everybody that was believing that God was going to come through. So I'm sorry. I am not accepting anything but complete, absolutely irrevocable, on time, God-given, Holy Ghost, apostolic, healing from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. To you that are in this building today, oh, may God bring you out of your prison that you came in one way, but you got to come out set free by the Spirit of God. So the original plan of God was never for human beings to be in hell. But the original plan of God was also not for Adam and Eve to fall into sin. So the original plan of God is on hold until there is no more time. And then God will thrust mankind back into what he intended 7,000 years ago. And this... 7,000 year momentary failure would just be a blip on the screen of time that is no more. But you cannot change the fact that when Abel, who was the first prophet, died, he did not go into heaven where God lives because he did not have a body without sin. And so, if you go back to the New Testament and you read the story of Lazarus and the rich rich men, you do a lot of study on this, but hell was divided into two compartments. One was called Sheol and the other is Hades. Sheol was not a place of torment, but it was a place of captivity for the Old Testament saints who live for God but could not go into the presence of the Father because their sins had ne- never been washed away. They'd only been postponed by the blood of bulls and goats, but they were still there. So Abel dies. And I preached to you recently that Abel was a prophet and that he foresaw by the Spirit when he brought that lamb slain to to God, he was declaring that there's somebody coming after me who's going to fix this. So think about it for a moment. Abel winds up in Sheol. He's held captive. He cannot go into heaven where the Father is because his blood has not yet been paid for by the perfect sacrifice. Now, every man and woman from that time on that begins to die that has lived for God no longer gets to go to heaven, but they wind up in Sheol. And the place begins to fill up, but you cannot stick people together that know about God without there not being some hope begin to arise. And I'm, and, I, and I'm just speculating here, so give me some latitude, but there, there, if place is filling up with all of these men and women that have served the Lord and they've died, and um, they're all talking because they get little bits and pieces that there's something coming. Somebody's going to come get us out of here. And one day, hallelujah, in, in walks this man. And... Those that are there, you know, every time somebody walks in, they're probably looking and and, and hoping that 
Maybe this is him. And so in he walks and he's regal looking and he's older looking. And yet there's this awe about him. His name was Moses. And Moses, the Bible said that his face shone like an angel. So he's kind of lit up. And he walks in and they said, are you him? And he said, no. He said, I'm not him. But he said, I, I know this, that I heard by the Spirit that he's raising up somebody that's like unto me. And he's going to bring deliverance because he's on his way. Yeah. And so Moses takes his place. And the... Settles down until one day they look up and here comes this, this gentleman and he looks a little bit of unusual and, and they look at him and when he comes in, he just, he got something going on with him and they looked at him and they said, are you him? He said, no, my name is David. But he said, he told me that he will not leave my soul in hell. And I found out that he's got a kingdom and the scepter of his kingdom is righteousness and holiness. And I know that he's on his way. And they looked at each other and said, that's good news, but God is getting ready to happen. I know that he's on his way. Years go by, perhaps even centuries go by, and one day in walks this guy. He's an old guy. He's got a beard. And they looked at him. They said, you got to be him. He said, no, my name's Isaiah. But I saw him, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and it was full of the glory of the Lord. He said, I know that he's coming back, for he's going to be glorious without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. He said, I'm not him, but I know what he looks like. Hundreds of years pass. And they're all sitting around, and Moses and David and Isaiah and Abel and different ones, and they're talking about Cannot wait for the day that I get out of here. And one day the gates open. And in is ushered in this man. He's close to 90. And they looked at him and said, are you him? Have you come to get us? He said, no. He said, my name is Daniel. But he said, I saw him sit down before the Ancient of Days. And the Ancient of Days gave him an everlasting kingdom that will here have no end. He said, I saw by revelation that he's going to come back. And when he comes back, he's going to shake the earth by the power of the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you by the Spirit that God, hallelujah, is not done. If we thought maybe over times past... Was it Pensacola? Was it Azusa Street? Was it Kansas City? Was it something else? But every time there's been a move of the Lord, it is declaring that I am coming back. I am not going to leave you forsaken. I will never leave you an orphan. Hear me, my children, saith the Lord, the best is yet to come. Lift up your head, for your redemption draws nigh. In the name of the Lord, I come against hell. In the name of Jesus, I bind every demon in the earth. We declare revival, revival, revival. I declare breakthrough. We declare healing because he's on his way. <laughs> it's been almost 4,000 years in walks a man and now they just can't wait to ask I said you gotta be him he said no he said my name is Zachariah but I saw him and he was standing on the Mount of Olives with his feet and they split and he became king over the whole earth. And he's on his way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
and he sat down with Moses and Isaiah and and they're talking about what they've seen over the times. And finally, one day, the gates open and in walks another man. And by now, they're thinking, it's got to be it. It's got to be it. And they, they looked at him and they said, you got to be him. Have you come to get us out? He said, no. He said, my name is Malachi. He said, but I can tell you this. I saw him and he's coming with healing in his wings because he's the son of righteousness. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. By this time, <clears throat> I think Ezekiel's high five in Isaiah. And Isaiah's over there hitting Moses, hallelujah. And they're saying, I told you, I know he's coming. I know he's coming, hallelujah. One day, the gates swing open and it's light like they've never seen. And this figure is glowing <clears throat> with the glory of God. And they're thinking, that's him. That's him. And as he got close, and the splendor of the light, the righteousness of God is coming out. And they said, you got to be him. He said, no. He said, but I've been hanging out with him on the cross. I'm just a thief. But he told me today, hallelujah, today, oh, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And he said, guys, I'm glowing because I've been hanging out with him. Can I tell you, I'm seeing a light in the atmosphere. By the Spirit of the Lord, there shall be light in the evening time. And hell saying, no, no, no. But God is saying, yes, yes, yes. They said, tell us about him. He said, oh, he's magnificent. Just when they thought they had him. Hallelujah. He said, the heavens open. And his father began to speak. And then he turned and looked at me. And he said, tell him I'm coming today. About that time, the gate swung open. But this time, there was something that went through hell. on the earth it looks like it's over death hallelujah has created a prison called a grave and they stuck Jesus in it but just when they thought they had him Jesus broke out of bri out of prison and he to break right in to hell he broke out of the prison of death to break in to the place of hell. And that day when it looked like there was no hope, down comes this ancient of days, son. And he looked at the gates and he kicked them in and he walked on in and he walked over and he said, hello, fellas, I'm here today. And the king of kings and the Lord of lords brought into hell. He broke into Satan's prison that was supposed to be maximum security can I tell you right now the church and America and our people have been put into prison but we declare by the name of the Lord that this thing is going to be broken I loose I loose I loose an anointing of God to break loose in our government in our supreme court in our congress and God begin to set captivity captive free and while they're standing there 
David looked over at Isaiah and said, I told you, that's him. That's who I knew wouldn't leave me here. Isaiah said, I saw him. That's what he looked like. And they come over and Jesus said, hello, guys. He said, let's get out of here. And the Bible says that Jesus began to take into captivity these people. Now, in that same setting of Scripture, it says that Jesus, he went into hell, captured these men, ascended, and he gave gifts. Apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, authority, healing, deliverance, freedom. He walks into hell where no deliverer has ever been. Thank you, Houston. Up until that time, nobody's ever had the authority to walk in. Think about it. Elijah couldn't even get himself out of this one. Didn't matter how powerful they were, David, as many as he killed the client, he could not set himself free. The problem in the church today is we've been trying to bring deliverance into the house of God without the help of Jesus. So we have swallowed hook, line, and sinker that you can counsel demons. So when guys want to pastor and they're in major organizations, they, now they don't even want to ordain you unless you have a some kind of degree, you know, you got a degree in counseling, you got a degree in theology. Can I tell you that the enemy doesn't give a rat's rear about how much you know in the spirit realm? Doesn't care about your PhD, doesn't care about your theology, doesn't care about who you are. You know, I love Timothy Dixon. I watch him, I believe he's a true man of God. Doesn't speak with the greatest English but I would rather hear him any day than some of these dried up, dead in the wool men and women that don't have a clue what's going on in the Holy Ghost. And I thank God for men and women, hallelujah, that hell has, has to bow down. Every time Timothy Dixon begins to give a video, I think hell's going, no, no, no. And then you got these mega churches when we get up with a 15 minute on how to have better finances. And the enemy's going, go for it. Hallelujah. Why? Because that's not what shakes the foundations of hell. And when Jesus walked into hell, the game changed. I was watching Tom Selleck one time and um, somebody asked him, they said, he said, uh, they said, do you box? He said, no, I fight. <laughs> they said, well, what's the difference? He said, rules. <laughs> the problem is too many Christians want to fight the devil with rules and you need to fight dirty. Because he fights dirty. He will afflict your six-month-old baby. He will try to destroy your joy. He'll come against your peace. He'll try to get you hooked on drugs. And he'll make you kill yourself. And he'll take glee in it. He fights dirty. So we're going to fight, hallelujah, on his level by the power of the Holy Ghost. When I cast out demons out of people, there are many times that that demon will start crying and try to make me feel sorry for it. And I always tell him, I have no sympathy for you. You can cry all you want. You're going to come out in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Why? Because I'm not here to fight by rules. I'm here to fight by the blood of the Lamb. And when you fight like the enemy, there's going to be some blood involved. You're not going to come out of it like you haven't been in the battle, but you may be blood scarred, wounded, bleeding, clothes tore up, but when you come out of that, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us. See, Jesus just didn't invade hell to invade hell. 
but he needed some things because he knew that his kingdom that he was getting ready to release in the earth needed some stuff. So the Bible says that he went into hell, walked over to Abraham and said, come on, faith, I need you in the next millennium. Then he walks over to David and he says, come on, praise, because where we're going, there's going to be some praise in the earth. Hallelujah. Walks over to Elijah, says, come on, prophet, because we're going to release a prophetic word of the Lord in the atmosphere. Oh, can I tell you? He walks over to Samson and says, I need me a deliverer that may have a few flaws, but in the end will be triumphant in God. There is a spirit of the Lord that is reaching into the atmosphere, and God is trying to capture you and bring you out for such a time as this. First Corinthians fifteen fifty five says, O oh, death, where is thy sting? And O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Speaking of Jesus, we win. The people say, Well, Pastor, you know, are you afraid you know your church is gonna go back to a couple hundred people? Not in the least. I think there'll come a day we won't have room in here. We'll have to go somewhere else. Why? Because there is freedom in the atmosphere. What are you going to do when somebody's leg grows out? I like what Dr. Keenan Bridges said. He said, I'm not looking for parlor tricks anymore where one leg is a little bit longer than the other and somebody you know can't hear. I was watching William Branham. You know, you got all these so-called people who are moving in gifts, you know, you know, there's somebody in this section, and I think your neck hurts. Well, my God, if you got 2,000 people in the building, <laughs> half the building's neck hurts. Somebody over here, and your knee has pain in it. Of course it does. Half the people in the building are over 50. Everybody's knee hurts when you get over 50. And the gullible church is going, oh, my God, that's amazing. Because somebody raised their hand. William Branham did it like this. Says, your name is Mary Smith. You live in Rich Top, Connecticut at 413 Roger Streets. And you've just been diagnosed with terminal cancer in your breasts. But God said to tell you he just healed you. That's where we're going. Yeah. Hallelujah. Not this manipulation mess. Hallelujah. The name of the... I feel so much of the authority of the Lord right now in the name of Jesus. I heal you in Jesus' name. I command every demon in this building. Let them go by the Spirit of the Lord. Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Keep on standing. I'm done. There is a prison break going on in our nation right now in the Holy Ghost. And the media is so dumb they don't know it. But God knows by the Spirit of the Lord. And I see God, hallelujah, that has come down into this hellish situation. And the Lord is going to lead captivity captive by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the Spirit of the Lord, we loose an Elijah in this building. We loose a Moses, hallelujah, in this building. We loose a David spirit in this building by the power of the Lord. So right now, from side to side, to every nation under the sound of my voice, to every member of our online church, I loose an anointing on you in Jesus' name. May God begin to invade your prison in the name of the Lord. If you are bound today by sickness, divorce, disease, depression, wherever you are, get out from where you are right now and quickly come to this front as my prayer partners come because there isn't an anointing of the Spirit of the Lord in this building.
Run, hallelujah. This is your chance for God to heal you, deliver you, set you free, to break the yokes. In the name of Jesus, God wants to break you out of your prison. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. Listen, while the Spirit of the Lord is hot in the atmosphere, God wants to, listen, He loves you. God is on your side in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we release, we release.